All right, welcome everyone. We're getting started here in just a moment. <clears throat> yeah, YouTube's good. All right, thanks everyone. Welcome to the next, the penultimate Water, Wetlands and Watersheds seminar for spring 21. Today, we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Samantha Chapman. Dr. Chapman is a professor and scientist at Villanova University in Pennsylvania. She's currently the co-director of the Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Stewardship, or CBEST, and she runs the Wet Feet Project. Here you see the uh, nice little icon she's gonna tell us about Wet Feet. She received her PhD from Northern Arizona University and did a postdoc at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. I assume that was down in Panama, in at Stry. Um, yeah, I'm Stry. Yep. Yeah. And so she's an ecosystem ecologist. She's interested in climate change and how it's changed biodiversity and ecosystem services that mostly coastal ecosystems provide. And she's worked on grants from NASA, US Forest uh, Service, National Science Foundation. Um, and her team collaborates to understand climate change and rising sea level impacts on coastal ecosystems. So with that, Dr. Chapman, Samantha, I give you the floor. It's all yours. Thanks so much, David, and thanks for having me. You know, this, um, you, the Center for Wetlands is, has these great seminars and it's, it's contributing a great amount to wetland science in general. So I'm honored to be here today and I feel lucky to collaborate with Christine Angelini and know the work of Dr. Kaplan. And so, um, yeah, it's great to be here. So today I'm gonna talk about um, how I've been leading this project over the past four years to try to understand how vegetation change and climate change are influencing ecosystem processes. In particular, um, we do fairly large scale experiments to actually sort of change ecosystems in the way in which we think global change is pushing them. And we do this not only to understand how those global changes will transform these ecosystems, but also to sort of push the systems. And that allows us to look at some of the inherent mechanisms that are driving processes in wetlands and therefore learn more about them um, empirically. And so I'll just say first, like all, all scientists should that, you know, this is a huge team effort. I think we have at this point somewhere around 40 different people working in different capacities on the wet feed project. And this brings both good ideas into the project um, and lots of hard work. And it also makes a lot of fun. So I'm really grateful to all the people that I work with on this project um, in order to do this cool science. So it feels sort of strange for me in Pennsylvania to be telling you in Florida what your uh, past looks like, but I'm going to do that anyway. So um, the last time the earth was this warm, this is sort of what Florida looked like with the green being the land and the blue being the water. And so we know that the last time the earth was this warm, a lot of Florida currently was underwater. Um, during the last glacier, glacial period, where of course we had a drop in sea levels, there was a lot, not a lot more land exposed, and we could, you know, there was much, Florida was much larger. And then we have present day Florida, and I think this is important to think about because we really do need to think about kind of history in order to understand why wetlands are where they are now. So there was this great paper, and I'm going to do this in particular talking about mangroves. Um, this past year, by Neil Santlin and colleagues um, from Australia, in which they looked at sort of the how did mangroves colonize coastlines around the world? And it's thought that current Florida mangroves probably started growing about 6,000 years ago. Um, and this happened because around that time, as you can see here from this graph, where age is on the x-axis and the relative sea level is on the y-axis here. You guys can see my cursor, right? That's okay. Um, yep. Okay, cool. So around 6,000 years ago, you know, the sea level rise started to flatten a little bit, right, after the ice had been melting. And therefore, as sea level started to rise, started to decrease and sea levels became more static, these mangroves along the Florida coast, coast started growing. And so with these data, this team from Australia was able to extrapolate and figure out that the rate of sea level rise that mangroves can handle, at least historically, was around six to seven millimeters per year. And so I think this information is important for us thinking about as we move into the future. And I'll sort of come back to this later when we talk about some of our projections um, with a new model that we have to think about how sea level rise um, is gonna affect these coastal ecosystems in Florida. And so just to review how wetlands build soil, um, I just wanted to go through this kind of little animation quickly. So if we go back again in time, about 10,000 years ago, around this time again is when we know sea levels were rising really rapidly. And during this time, there were no wetlands forming. And this, 
you know, it was collaborated by the work of Santolin and colleagues with these cores when they showed that mangroves, you know, started colonizing around 6,000 years ago. And then over about the last eight to 6,000 years, depending on who you, who you believe, um, these wetlands started forming. And this is the case for both salt marshes up here in the Northeast where I am, as well as mangroves in Florida and down into Central America and other places where I've worked. And so these wetlands have been forming because of two major processes. One, these plants, both salt marshes and mangroves are really good at catching sediment. And that sediment is deposited on the soil and builds up over time. The other reason why these wetlands were formed during this time when sea levels were not rising very rapidly is because these plants were producing organic matter in particular roots, and those roots were building up over time and they were not decomposing, which is something I'll also talk about today. And therefore these roots were building up and creating peat and therefore elevating these wetlands and allowing them to keep pace with sea level rise. The question of course remains, and I know that many of you are familiar with this, that you know what happens now, right? What happens as we move into a future in which we know particularly in certain parts of Florida, the sea levels are rising very rapidly. Can these wetlands actually keep up with sea level rise? And so that's really the kind of broader context for the work type of work that I'm doing. The other contextual thing I need to tell you about is about mangrove encroachment. And many of you are familiar with this, perhaps through Dr. Angelini's work, um, that mangroves are encroaching really rapidly into wetlands around the world in these areas where the temperate zone and the tropical zone come together. And this is happening particularly quickly in Florida and in particular in Northeast Florida where I do a lot of my work. So it is the case in Northeast Florida that the most cold tolerant mangrove, Avicennia germinans, the black mangrove, um, is invading into salt marshes. And because this mangrove is the most freeze tolerant, it seems to be doing really well, even in situations where there are freezes. And we can talk about that later if you want. That's another thing that we're sort of investigating. But once these little mangrove, oops, sorry. Go back a slide. These little mangrove propagules wash up on the beaches and then in a high water event, they are carried up into the salt marshes. These little mangrove seedlings start growing and then they grow really rapidly as I'll show you today. And that rapid growth leads to, to overtop the marsh. You can't really see this too well here, but there's essentially a little halo of mangrove seedlings around this plant. So it makes a lot of babies, those babies, babies grow up and so on. And so it's not just the northern movement of mangroves or the poleward movement of, of mangroves that's happening in the southern hemisphere that's driving this process. It's actually the rapid fill-in of mangroves into these salt marshes. And that's the, the kind of the direction that we're moving to try to understand that, that changes and really transform these ecosystems from grassy or succulent dominated systems into forests. Um, so this is just some aerial imagery done by one of my graduate students looking at one of our sites, um, which is near marine land, if anyone is familiar with that. Um, so this site is very close to marine land and essentially this little box indicates where our tra warming chambers are and you're going to be able to see them kind of appear. So this is 2005 and you can see in 2005 that there were not many mangroves at this site. However, by moving forward into the future and I'll just jump, you know, by 2019, the site has many mangroves. And so I just want to point out, and this is not my work, but it's some of, of my colleagues, that mangroves have come and gone in Northeast Florida for a long time over history, right? There are mangroves, there's a great paper by some of my colleagues that mangroves were, um, Bartram found mangroves in Northeast Florida way back in time. And they have kind of come and gone with freezes, right? These deep freezes that can kill them off. But in today's world, these mangroves are increasing again, and they're not just increasing northward right now, they're out right along the St. Mary's River at the border with Georgia, um, but they're also filling in really rapidly. And this may be different than what we've seen in the past. The other big thing that's happening now is these freeze events don't seem to be as extreme as they were in the past. And so the idea of them getting completely knocked back is kind of up for debate. You know, will these mangroves die off with a deep freeze events? One of these polar vortexes that actually tends to kill them off over time and did so in the 80s. You know, the question remains, but just kind of keep that in mind as a broader context that this is not a totally new phenomenon. There were mangroves in Northeast Florida in the past. They are here, they are again, and they are there um, and ever increasing. So this brings me to the project that I'm leading, um, the Wet Feet Project, which is this sort of a nice acronym for this annoying long title, the Warming Ecosystem Temperatures in a Florida Ecotone Experiencing Transition. And so this work is being done with my co-PI, 
guys, Candy Feller from Smithsonian, um, Mark Hester at University of Louisiana, Jim Morris at South Carolina, Nikki Dix at the GTM um, National Estuarine Reserve, who is our really our major partner in this work. Um, we could not do this work without the research support of the GTM and um, it's fantastic working with them as collaborators. And then Adam Langley at Villanova. This work's funded by the NSF. And I'll just say that, you know, we had been working in the mangrove ecotone before this as part of a NASA project. And we were working where this green star is here. So this is down at the Kennedy Space Center. We, like the mangroves, have moved up. You can see here in yellow where salt marshes are dominant to the north parts of Florida. And mangroves are dominant with this red line here down to the south. And so we used to work about you know five, six years ago now at this green star, which was kind of the epicenter of the ecotone where mangroves were encroaching into salt marshes. And we have had to move our research up the coast because the mangroves are moving so rapidly up the coast and sort of filling in in these salt marshes. And so now we're here and we're actually starting to work at some sites all the way up here because this is happening so quickly over the past decade. So we've been working on this conceptual model. Um, I, I feel as if I continually show this schematic, but I think it's helpful for me and hopefully for you too, to kind of think about what our questions are. And so um, one of these days I'll finally get around to figuring all this out, but that's, that's what a career is. But one of the things we're trying to understand is how mangrove invasion, and I don't really love that term anymore, I made this a couple of years ago, really encroachment um, into salt marshes and chronic warming that's occurring that we all know in these wetland ecosystems and in all ecosystems are influencing the processes below ground that maintain surface elevation of wetlands, right? Which is this position that they hold with respect to sea level that allows them to keep up with sea level rise. And so we're I'm trying to understand both of these processes, both warming and mangrove encroachment. And these below ground processes that I'll talk about today, some of them, things like root growth, which tends to, as more roots grow in an ecosystem, sort of pushes up the surface elevation and the process of organic matter decomposition, which as organic matter decomposes, which it does very slowly in wetlands, right? This is why they are wetlands because there's low oxygen availability in these soils and soil microbes are not able to decompose organic matter very rapidly. But if decomposition were to speed up, let's say from warming, like has been seen in some terrestrial ecosystems or through aeration of the soil, let's say by mangrove roots, it's very possible then that decomposition could speed up and that could actually decrease surface elevation and lead to some peak collapse and allow these systems to become more inundated more rapidly. And so that's what we're working on and I'll come back to this as I go throughout um, the seminar today. So we're working at three different sites in Northeast Florida. Um, so Marine Land, just to orient you, is right around here. The Whitney Labs right down here. Um, so these three sites span a relatively small latitudinal gradient, just a couple, um, not even two degrees, but they span what is really kind of this active part of the ecotone right now, where we have fewer mangroves to the north and more mangroves to the south. And the sites kind of look like this. This is our most northern site, and this is our most southern site. And you can see there are many more and much larger mangroves down here than they are up here. And this intermediate site is kind of in between those two. And so this is where we're doing our warming experiments. As I said, you know, I think these experiments are really useful to kind of push the system and see what happens, right? If we create the future, create the temperatures that we're going to see in the future, what happens to plant growth? What happens to these below ground processes? And so this is just a drone shot of one of our sites where we have these warming chambers. And I'll now tell you about what the design for these experiments are. So we have four treatments. We have um, two types of vegetation, marsh and mangrove. And then we have two types of treatments, warming and control. And you can see our little platforms here. This would be a control chamber and this would be an adjacent warming chamber. And these are really low tech, right? We explored all kinds of things like active warming, like they're doing at Smithsonian where I used to work to warm the soils. And as you can imagine in these places, which are somewhat difficult to get to, as all of you know, in wetlands and are also wet, um, it's really hard to have electricity. <laughs> and so we use these little greenhouses, which do a fairly good job of warming up the air temperature. I should note that these um, do not warm up the soil temperature. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So this is what our experiments look like. And we have an N of six so that at each of the three sites, there are 24 plots. And these are the four treatments that I just told you about. Um, this is what our 
like what is going on inside the plot. So, and I really need to um, acknowledge Gabby Canis, who's both a technician and a graduate student. She um, is a graduate student at UNF now and works at the GTM Reserve and really has been maintaining these chambers, which as you can imagine with tropical storms, and other things, it can be challenging to get the film off and then put it back on and the PVC breaks and all that. So she's really the hero of the project in terms of making this happen over time. And so inside each of these plots or chambers, we have all kinds of infrastructure. And this is just some of it. You know, we have core water wells in collaboration with um, Todd Osborne. We have all kinds of measurements of community type things that we've been starting to do. And then we have these parameters that I showed you in that conceptual schematic. So those include decomposition bags, rooting growth bags, um, dowels, looking at wood decomposition, um, as well as hobos, which you see here, where we're measuring air temperature, humidity, soil temperatures, all of the micrometeorological things that you need to know in order to see that first that our experiments are working and then sort of how the plant cover and the changes that are going on that are influencing micrometeorological um, factors. And so what this looks like, just to give you an idea, is this is the decomposition bag. Some of the data I'll show you today are from these. Um, we have these decomposition ladders. One of the things that are of course important in wetlands is the depth of the peat, right? The depth of the soil, um, and we can imagine that at deeper levels in the soil, we would have less decomposition because there's less oxygen available down there. And so we're watching decomposition occur at these different levels in the soil. And that's why we built these ladders to do that. Um, we also have root ingrowth bags, right? These essentially fruit bags that we allow roots to grow into, and then we can measure below ground productivity. So the first thing I'll tell you um, data wise is that our experiments are working. So we get about 1.6 degrees Celsius warming on average. This is different in the war in the winter and the summer. We get um, over the we're almost at three years. We get more warming during the summer, which kind of makes sense the way the chambers work, like little greenhouses. Um, and we do actually get a tiny bit of cooling at night, as you can see here during the night. So these are um, hours of days. The most warming is of course occurring during kind of midday, and then it drops down again. Um, I should say that there's no difference in humidity or poor water salinity between warm and control plots. And there's actually, you know, complete hydrological flow. I don't know if you can see it here, but these platforms are sort of set up so there can be water flowing in, in unimpeded in and out of the plots at any time. So we're not like getting standing water in there or anything like that. But because of that water movement, this creates a situation in which we cannot warm the soils, right? Specific heat of, of water. Um, is obviously different than air and therefore we don't get soil warming. And so in order to address that problem, we've partnered with um, so our colleagues at University of Louisiana and are using the USGS mesocosms there to actually do a soil warming experiment. So I'll show you a little bit about that today. So warming is working and it is influencing as you could imagine, you know, sometimes I feel like I do the most obvious things, but it may, when it's warmer, mangroves grow more, right? This is probably not surprising to any of you. They're at the edge of their range. And so what you can see here is that over our three sites, the warmed plots are showing more stem elongation. This is um, one year of data. We weren't able to measure stem elongation this past year for obvious reasons. And so we were able to get some of our measurements, but not this kind of time intensive one. And so we're just looking here at one year of data. And what you can see is the warmed plots, particularly at the more Northern sites are responding to warming and mangroves are growing more in terms of stem elongation. So we do this on multiple stems, we tag them, and then we see how much they grow over time. Um, in some cases, we see you know one to three meters of growth on a single plant. And I should say these mangroves are about mm, seven to 10 years old. They're fairly small. And so they're growing really, really rapidly. As you can see, the Southern site is actually growing the fastest, but it is not responding as much to warming as the two more Northern sites. I should just say, and be honest about this, um, that we are not seeing a big temperature difference across the three sites that we can pick up with our hobos anyway. We aren't seeing that the northern site is a lot colder, although of course I don't feel like we're completely picking up all the vagaries of time of temperature and you know extreme events and things like that. But the, the mean temperatures at the three sites are about the same, but there's something about this northern site and the southern site that they really differ in how fast the plants are growing. And so one of my graduate students is working on that and we think it may actually have to do with the vegetation. The northern site is much more dominated by Sportina 
alterniflora, and the southern side is much more dominated by betas. And so it seems as if the mangroves might actually be impeded a little bit in their growth by that Spartina alterniflora, which has been seen in China and other places. Um, there's some really interesting papers coming out on fungal associates and how that might change um, the way you know, Spartina can actually have negative effects on other plants in the area. So that's pretty cool. So the warming treatment also affected other things about above ground growth. It affected mangrove height um, after two years um, at the two more northern sites. And so you can see here that heights were also higher in the warming plots. And so again, our main questions are about below ground processes, but we can think about these above ground processes as being like, okay, now there's all this more photosynthate to, to sh shunt below ground and allow these plants to potentially produce more roots. And so that's kind of the next question that I'll get to. But I wanna point out one thing here, which is that uh, there's been a lot of really great work done on uh, mangroves throughout the world by some of my colleagues trying to figure out blue carbon in mangroves and in particular using remote sensing to do this. And one of the things that's often done is using mangrove heights. And while mangrove heights can be really useful in places like Colombia and Panama and other parts of the deep, um, deeper tropics, it, it is not very useful in understanding mangrove growth in these ecotonal environments. And also even in some really tropical environments where mangrove growth is nutrient limited, many mangroves around the world grow in this shrubby way where they don't grow very tall, but they just grow out. And one of the things we've been able to find in this project, which was not our intention was so mangroves are growing five times more wide than they are tall. And so they're expanding rather than growing up. And I think that has some really important implications for one, how they're actually taking over in these wetland environments, how they're sort of spreading and overtopping the salt marshes, but also how we might consider that they're growing in other places around the world as we consider this expansion rather than tall growth like we can get from things like LIDAR data. So, Again, we know that warming and um, is increasing mangrove growth from our schematic at this point. I should say that we're not seeing big differences in the way that the salt marshes are growing. We've done warming experiments um, in another site down south at Kennedy Space Center, and that did affect Desticulus spicata growth. That actually grew faster um, in warming chambers, but that's not the case here with Spartina alterniflora or Betis. It seems to be that they are not responding to warming. So what about the below ground stuff, which I told you is kind of the, the heart of this. Um, I'll say that just to give you the bottom line, this graph is not perfect. It sort of shows all the treatments of both veg two vegetation types, mangroves and marshes, and control, which is in these blue dots here, and the red dots, which are warming plots. And this is really the work of my graduate student, Emily Gahagan. We have found that both the fact that mangroves are in a plot and the warming of a plot means that there is more root growth. So both of those factors elevate root growth and this makes sense based on what I just told you about above ground growth, that mangroves are growing more in warming conditions, they're growing fairly fast at these sites and therefore they are putting more roots into the ground, particularly when it's warmer than the Spartina alterniflora. And this is pretty interesting because Spartina alterniflora in particular tends to have really prodigious root growth and rhizomes and other things. And so the fact that these mangroves are increasing um, above that in terms of root productivity is pretty interesting. And so the other side of that equation, of course, as I told you, was decomposition. And really, I should say that when I first started doing this work um, in ecotones, and really it was by accident, I was working in like, quote unquote, real mangroves for a while, um, is that, you know, we kept just seeing this happen, right? And when we would drive north, oh, look at all those mangroves in that marsh and things like that. And, you know, other people like Christine and others have been working on this um, in Florida. But... I really was concerned about the fact that mangroves do have a lot of aranchyma in their roots, right? These like hollow pipes in their roots. And the idea was that oxygen could perhaps diffuse into these soils in the marshes and maybe mangroves would aerate these, these soils and allow there to be increased decomposition. And so this kind of kept me up at night a little bit because I was worried that if we stimulate decomposition in these ecosystems or really change them, that could be problematic for surface elevation because I kind of guessed that there would be more roots. And so I'll just tell you that it's not the case. Root decom, this is one of those um, negative results things. And I, we've looked at this 
in four different ways now, decomposition, um, and we're just seeing no effects. We don't see, for example, any effects of the type of vegetation on mass loss in decomposition. We don't see um, any effects of plants and has been seen at, in other marshes and other places that plant type prime soil organic matter decomposition. Plant type doesn't seem to matter here in terms of priming soil respiration. This is done in mesocosms, again, by my student, Emily. Um, we looked at different microbial inocula, and I'm not showing you that here, to see whether that changed decomposition rate in different in vials in the lab, and we didn't find any effects there. And then finally, we didn't find any differences um, across the sites in decomposition or due to warming. And again, this is these are pretty messy data. And I'm sorry, these are different from my other figures. Um, but if you, know, if you just look at this band here, there's no statistical difference at any of these sites or due to warming or due to plant type in decomposition. Decomposition is pretty much staying the same. It's also staying the same at different depths, which is really surprising. And I think that this tells us that you know, we're not going to see a big change in decomposition because mangroves are moving into these ecosystems or because they're warming. However, as I told you, we are not warming up the soils. And so that's a big deal, right? We're not changing the temperature of the soil, which we know have seen in you know, permafrost ecosystems and grasslands and other places that when you warm up soils, organic matter decomposition could go more quickly. And so in order to do this, again, we use these mesocosms at the USGS um, work site in Louisiana. And this is the graduate student, Harris Stevens, that did this work. And he looked at cellulose decomposition in these mesocosms. And he had Avicin Avicinia mesocosms, Spartina mesocosms, mixtures, and then unvegetated ones. And he saw that there was a little bit of difference um, due to warming. And again, he had three different treatments. We tried to match the treatments that we were using in some of these other field experiments and lab experiments. Um, in medium warming treatments in these big tubs, these mesocosms he did, he saw a little bit faster um, decomposition of the cellulose. And this is pretty interesting because it shows that at like high warming temperatures, you're actually not seeing more decomposition. And this matches another one of the experiments we did where at really high warming temperatures. And again, these aren't that high. These are, I think they were 32 degrees Celsius. Um, we did not see um, increased decomposition. And in fact, we actually saw decreased microbial respiration. So the microbes were actually, you know, suffering, so to speak, in these really warm temperatures. And so that's pretty interesting. Um, and in the Abyssinia, um, mesocosms, we didn't see any differences in decomposition due to warming in these soils. And so I think this tells us that we know here on our schematic that both mangrove invasion and warming can increase root growth, but that neither of these processes tends to change organic matter decomposition. And therefore, if we expect to see a difference in surface elevation, it's likely that we would see a difference in the positive direction rather than the negative direction. And that's what we have seen at another site at the Kennedy Space Center. We, we didn't measure all of these things there, but we did see increased surface elevation due to mangrove encroachment. It was a different species of mangroves and due to air temperature warming. But we need to figure this out, right? So what we've been doing is partnering with, with some scientists from the USGS um, in order to measure surface elevation. And the nice thing about this method that we're using, which is barcode laser leveling, is we've used SETs in the past, is that we can really measure elevation over large areas at all of our plots um, and not just get within inside our experimental infrastructure, but measure elevation kind of across across the landscape in these wetlands. And so this is a, a, a kind of a new technique that um, was talked about in this paper and compared to SETs by Kane and Hensel et al in 2018. And so we've kind of been piloting it and it seems to be working fairly well. So at this point, we were just down there um, last week measuring elevation again. So we don't yet know how two and a half years of warming is influencing elevation in these plots, but the, we'll, we'll know soon. And so I'll let you know about that. But even though we don't know that, we're sort of jumping ahead with all of the data that we have so far about below ground processes and above ground growth, as well as a lot of the other physical inputs that we've been measuring, um, climate and tides. Um, 
and some of the things that we've been doing in the greenhouse in order to parameterize a few models. Um, and I'll just, I'm gonna talk about one of these really briefly in the next five minutes. Um, but the two models that we're using are, first we're using this coastal, or second we're using this coastal vulnerability model. Um, and this is really more of us kind of an applied model where we're actually looking at the coastal vulnerability of the GTM NER. And we're doing that of course, because we wanna know how vulnerable are these wetlands at this special place that we're working. And so we're doing this in a very spatially explicit way using the INVEST model. And this is in partnership with Greg Rutez and one of my students, um, Philip Yang, who's looking for in particular boat wakes in the, in the NER. I'm not gonna talk about that today. I will talk about this model that it, we are using and really have changed with Jim Morris. And so this is the, what we're now calling QUEM or the Coastal Wetland Equilibrium Model. Some of you may be familiar with the MEM model, which has been used all around the world to look at, it's called the Marsh Equilibrium Model, to look at marshes and see how well they're keeping up a sea level rise. And so Jim, um, has been a fantastic partner in this, in the fact that he essentially had to rebuild this entire model to work for perennial vegetation. And so this is no easy task, right? To go from marshes, which don't have wood, <laughs> or some marshes that don't have wood, right? These kinds of marshes that we're working in to you know mangroves, which are trees and build biomass in very different ways. Um, and so we have now, um, he has now kind of completed the, the building of this model and we've been using our data data from the field to parameterize it. And so these are not yet um, published, these results, but I'll just show, walk you through quickly kind of what we've been finding so far. And so we're running this QEM model for both Spartina marshes and for Abyssinia, and we're running it in particular for um, both young mangroves and mature mangroves, because I think one of the things that's really important to understand about the potential surface elevation maintenance of these systems is when do the mangroves get there? And so what you see here is that many, and we know this, right, for many places in South Carolina and Georgia and Northeast Florida and other parts of Florida, that marshes um, are in pretty bad shape. And so if we look at these different, three different sea level rise scenario, blue is 40 centimeters, black is 80 centimeters, and red is 100 centimeters, you see that Spartina marshes are only surviving that 40 centimeter sea level rise scenario, which is you know, fairly conservative. And we think that it is likely we will get more sea level rise than 40 centimeters in these types of systems. And so both the standing biomass and of course then the relative elevation of these systems are declining over time. And I just wanna orient you to this graph here. Essentially this is looking at relative elevation on the x-axis and standing biomass on the y-axis. And so you can sort of like walk through a trajectory of what happens with biomass due to elevation changes. And so if we start here, you know, at a given biomass and elevation, and then for a given sea level rise scenario, we walk down and here, you know, at the 40 centimeter one, we end here and biomass doesn't collapse and elevation is maintained, even though it's a little bit lower. If we go through the black and the red scenarios, 80 centimeters and 100 centimeters, we see that these really quickly, these marshes just bottom out and are submerged, you know, between 80 to 100 years from now. So this is Spartina. If we do the same thing for mangroves, and here I'm showing you the results for mature mangroves, what you can see here is that the mangroves are doing much better under these sea level rise scenarios. So they are have much higher tidal accretion. It's like 1.4 centimeters per year um, compared to 0.28. Um, the mature mangroves are surviving sea level rise scenarios up to 80 centimeters over 100 years. And so you can see that again, if we just focus here um, on this final graph, you see that interestingly, at lower sea level rise scenarios, these mangroves actually end up at a lower standing biomass than they do if you impose these higher sea, higher sea level rise scenarios on them. And so they are accreting more and building more biomass under these high sea level rise scenarios. And they end up in situations, at least for 80 and 40 again, where they are surviving. That's not necessarily gonna be the case for the 100 centimeter sea level rise scenario where things start to really um, go downhill after 100 years. Now, this is a model, right? Like all models, it essentially creates hypotheses for us to test, but you know, to test these, of course, we have to rapidly move into the future. But I think it also allows us some predictable um, predictability and what we might think are more 
are more vulnerable sites and potentially some management things that um, we need to think about going into the future if we want to save these wetlands. And so one of the ways that we're thinking about this is actually using pioneer mangroves. And so these little mangroves, if we start them here on the x-axis to sea level rise, and this is in millimeters per year. Um, and, I and here on the y-axis is survival time. If we start these baby mangroves at two different ele starting elevations, 45 centimeters versus 55 centimeters, they end up in different places. And this is perhaps not survive, uh, surprising, but it allows us to get at like these threshold numbers here. And remember, I told you that um, the sampling paper said mangroves could survive six to seven you know, millimeters per year in sea level rise scenario. And here we're showing that these mangroves can survive more than that. But the interesting thing is that if juvenile mangroves are establishing at the upper level limit of their vertical range, around 55 centimeters of elevation, they could mature when the sea level rise is like 18 millimeters or less, but no more. And juveniles that establish at the lower elevations, like 45, would drown before they mature. So this gets us to like a timing issue. When do the mangroves get into these marsh wetlands? And therefore, when might we expect them to be able to kind of build more elevation to potentially keep up sea level rise? Or do they not get there, right? And so this raises all sorts of ethical and other questions about assisted migration. And I'll just tell you right off the bat, I don't, I don't have a good answer for this. Um, we know that the mangroves are getting into these systems in some places really quickly. Um, but, you know, I don't know that it's quick enough. A lot of the mangrove delivery is due to hurricanes and it's very much due to sort of inlets and other things hydrologically. And so this raises some interesting questions. So I'll just say that again, a lot of this work is being done by my graduate students and graduate students at our partner institutions and they're working on physiology and other communities and crabs and things like that. Um, but I think our implications or the implications of what I talked about today is that you know, mangrove growth is responding to warming at the ecotone, particularly at the more poleward sites. Um, encroachment and warming increase root growth and don't change decomposition, which could potentially allow for more surface elevation, which could allow these systems to keep up better with sea level rise. And when we parameterize this QEM model, we see that happening into the future. We see that these mangroves are keeping up with sea level rise better. And so maybe this kind of climate adaptation as it's being done by these mangroves can actually be helpful to us in sustaining some of these wetlands. And so with that, I will um, take any questions. Thank you so much, Samantha. So a round of Zoom applause or real applause, however you wish to do it. <clears throat> um, you know, use your icons, whatever. Um, so we'll go to questions. I'll go back and forth um, from the Zoom room to the, to the YouTube. But if there's anyone in the Zoom room right now who'd like to ask a question, please go ahead. So I have a question, Sam. Uh, yeah. How did you guys modify MEMS to uh, take into account that, that new woody debris? Yeah, so you know about this model because you two have been working with Jim as part of our RCN. Um, we use the cohort model, right? So that's sort of a piece of this. So these cohorts, and Kathy is really knowledgeable about this more than I am, um, essentially build soil over time. There's an increment of elevation that is built. And that is, of course, as you can imagine, different when you're putting roots of different chemical quality in the soil, as well as on different time frames. And so, yeah, I, you know, it, it seemed pretty hard. I felt like Jim felt like we were <laughs> so, so it sounds like, so, so the way MEMS currently implemented, we only have the fast carbon pool that's decaying. It sounds like maybe you now introduced a K term for your slow carbon pool and you changed the allocation between the fast and the slow um, root turnovers. And you maybe also get a, got a different root profile because your trees have diff have a different shape in their roots or a different depth to the roots. And it's not spatially explicit in that way, as you know, but the biggest change is the root turnover term. And as you okay. know, so that's what's most sensitive in this model. And that is really what's changed. I mean, the way it was built as it had to incorporate some of those other things, but yes, the root turnover by far is the, has the highest sensitivity in this. And so we've really worked on getting that number right based on our field data, but also based on sort of more mature mangroves in other types of places like in Florida and other places where there's pretty, some pretty good data from like the, that James has pulled out and things like that. Really cool study. Thanks so much. Yeah. 
Thanks. Well, <clears throat> so I have a question. So thinking about this difference between the north south, and you found like um, you know more in the northern sites, the warming was having more of an effect, and had some ideas about why that might be. And you mentioned biotic potential biotic interactions and betas versus. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess just thinking more broadly on about other biological controls, other you know trophic or biotic you know interactions that may be. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> affecting the sort of bottom up type of effect that you're looking for? Have you looked at other critters, basically? Yeah, David, I, and this is sort like, I used to do a lot of herbivory work in grad school and I love, I love that stuff. Um, and so we're sort of starting to venture back into that. So we'll, right now we're looking at um, benthic algae and we're looking at crabs and we're doing a little bit of microbial work. So the crab work is interesting because um, we've in particular been focusing on like trying to understand, and again, Christine knows about the crabs and things. I, I just know that they make holes. <laughs> so that's, you know, some of them do, right? So yeah, they like eating propagules, you know? So, and, and, right. they, and they can decimate like a young seedling if the density of crabs is high relative to food, right? Just like, you know, yeah. undergraduates at a pizza party, right? So they'll terrorize it. Um, so that's some, some work that we found too, is that you got to get above some kind of propagule density to release the mangroves. That's uh, a really good point. Yeah. And um, I there, if just off the top of my head, I think that Northern site does have more critters in it, right? Mm -hmm. I, it does seem to. And so, you know, these mangroves are doing this really weird precocious reproduction thing when they get into these ecotonal environments and that's been shown really well. So the propagules are there. It's really just that they don't get they're not happy, right? That said, so this is the, the most Northern site we are using in this project, but we've been venturing to some of these other more Northern sites right along the border with Georgia. And there, the mangrove seedlings, two-year-olds, three-year-olds seem to be doing great. So, which is also Spartina dominated. And so it kind of like my hypothesis and some of my graduate students work, which is really cool about like mangroves tend to the seedlings tend to do better when there's beta sand spartina, more cover, things like that. There, you know, we haven't measured cover, but it seems like they're doing better. But I, I might say that there's not as many critters at those sites. Just, and again, this is purely my just like seeing things. Yeah, that. well, same for me. Christine helped me figure out how to look at crabs. And, you know, the good thing is you can count the little holes <clears throat> and, and awesome. I have to actually film them all and count and, and look at each individual. So yeah. um, anyway, just something interesting to think about. Um, really, propagule stuff like, we haven't really thought about propagule predation, and I think that's a really good point. So yeah, cool. thank you. So other questions from Zoom, I'll check back on YouTube. My friends on YouTube, please drop any questions you have. So far it's quiet on the tube. Hey Sam, that was a, that was a nice talk, let's chime in. So I was really intrigued by um, that um, result that you noted towards the end of your talk about, um, let's see, I think you said that there was um, basically higher mangrove biomass at the greater sea level rise rates. Yes. And just, just I'm curious, like your thoughts on that, like a little bit more. I mean, I did note that, um, I think you also said that the elevation gain was something declined such that like, it wasn't clear, like whether this was really going to, like what the long, long term beyond the hundred years was the projection would be like, whether it was actually an okay response from the mangroves perspective. But yeah, just curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think that we're making certain assumptions about the way mangroves respond to sea level rise that has been built on our assumptions about marshes, right? So I'll just be flat out about that. But hmm. it seems as if my understanding is that we do know from historical records and, you know, SET data and things like that, that mangroves can build elevation really fast. But one of the things that Candy tells me all the time, and this is certainly, and I've, I've seen this in like Belize and other places, is like they can almost build themselves out Right. And so you get this switch between like in Belize, black mangroves and um, red mangroves where, you know, the red mangroves are build peat really quickly and they get to a certain elevation. It's too high. And then they start to get like droughted and it gets really salty and things like that. And then the black mangroves move in. And so this idea of this happening in the model may be that, you know, there's their sea levels are rising and they're building really quickly. And then there tends to be maybe you know, especially because it's Abyssinia, like some situation in which we, they, they build themselves out and they drop a little bit, right? And one of the things Jim keeps telling me, and again, this, he understands the workings of the model more than I do, is that when mangroves go down, they go down really quickly. Um, and so, and you're, and you're right, like sort of towards the end of that, you see that really big drop off. And I think that's because of 
the nature of the organic matter that they're building, which, you know, it can't, it's not that different chemically than spartina. I mean, yes, there are woody roots, but like lignin and nitrogen and some of these other things are not hugely different between these plants. It's more about kind of the, the tiering of that organic matter over time. And again, I don't think I'm, I'm, Andrew, I don't think I'm giving you a satisfactory answer to this, but yeah, I mean, it, it, did, it, did that get at what you're asking? Yeah, I was just trying to get a sense for, I mean, there's, I mean, yeah, there's clearly some like biology behind it. And um, yeah. yeah, it was just sort of like, I guess, counterintuitive. It wasn't what I was expecting to see when you, you know, threw the, the plot up there. And um, yeah, yeah so I was curious. And you weren't that. expecting to see which parts of the, the um, I guess that the biomass would go up. I think I'm trying to remember what the figure showed. There's two responses. One was biomass that did go up at a greater rate with higher sea level rise, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that was like a, like if I didn't know how the models put together. So I don't know if that's factoring like greater like nutrient supply with the, you know, greater inundation or greater something else or, yeah, no. or if it has more to do with just like the functioning of like the sediment and buildup and elevation. And yeah, I just, I think it's the latter, but, and I, but I think you're right in, in that we need to consider those nutrient things. So, I mean, if you think about a mangrove gradient, like along an Island somewhere else, right, there's different species, which is part of it, but it mm -hmm. does have that kind of like, higher biomass and then it drops off, you know, towards the interior where the sea, the sea level is not as high potentially. And so it sort of mimics that spatial pattern mm. temporally, but I think it has more to do with the actual accretion over time than eventually, you know, drops off once it reaches a certain point. But yeah, I mean, that the fact that they end up at higher biomass, it's not more nutrients, you know, why is that? I, I need to talk to Jim more about why. We I might have the answer for oh, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, so it's it's that, that response, that's, that's that com competition between how quickly the marsh surface is accreting and the sea level rise. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the, the relative difference between those two that's, cause, that's causing that biomass response curve. So it's an, it's an inundation response, basically. So is it almost like, you know, in many places with marshes right before they're about to go down, they green up a ton, right? They, they, they go crazy in terms of producing biomass and trying to keep up. And so they sort of look really amazing right before they go down, right? I think yeah. So, so, so if you think of that bell curve, they're, they're sort of bouncing around at, at the, they're being pushed over that hump and then they collapse. And so as you're getting pushed over that hump, things look really, really great. And then you go too far. Um, so at least that, that's what, what's in the, the, the MEMS models that I've been working with. Totally. And we, we've got some oh. new mathematics for MEMS now worked up that are really, really pretty. Oh. Um, so we've got a quasi steady state solution now that, that might actually help with some of the parameterizations. Awesome. I can't wait to hear more about that. All right, cool. Thank you. So that makes me think just a little bit about like the, you know, I think I was surprised to see that your respiration, your root decomposition rates were the same um, in, in all the, across this, across that, across this. And of course I went to, I was just thinking about like the quality of the carbon and, and yeah. like versus cellulose. And then it was about roots. And then there was, you know, the study about cellulose, but what, so I guess two questions, what about like the actual litter itself, the, the above ground litter in the marsh versus mangrove one, just its quality and how quickly it degrades, but also like when you're Spartina and you die, you just stay there. Yeah, and, yeah. And when you're a mangrove leaf and you die, you fall into the water and you go away. Yeah. Or some of it goes away. So, and of course your neighbor then contributes leaves to you. So it, there's a whole process, but how do you think about those two elements? Yes, I think that's a really good question. So I have done above ground litter decomposition with mangrove and you know, Avicinia just goes like that, right? It's like mm. crazy high in nitrogen and eats, eat, it's mm. most of the time it does. I think there's been some studies where it doesn't go that far but especially in these kind of interior marshes, but it goes away really fast. Whereas like you said, Spartina just kind of sits there. And so over time, the accretion of that, um, I don't know that it has a big, it, as Kathy said, it's not uh, It's not in the MEM model, right? That is yeah. not, but in okay. terms of our decomposition measurements, we probably should look at some above ground stuff to actually get at some of that. Yeah. And I see crabs, crabs may be playing, David, crabs may be playing a role here too, uh, taking those smaller pieces and putting them down into the soil. That's a good point. Yeah. The actual burial of things. Yeah. Right. And there's tons of activity at these sites. It's really a gap that we haven't, we don't, we haven't considered them enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so you got your warming chambers, you had some cages, you had some crabs, you had some above ground. There's plenty of work to do for like the next yeah. sea level is rising. 
<laughs> end of experiments. So that's awesome. Well, Samantha, thank you so much. Let's give another uh, round of applause to Dr. Chapman. Thank you so much for joining us today. And next week we have our last, uh, our last W3 seminar, which I never have pulled up in time to announce to you, but indeed it is our final speaker of the semester is going to be Matthew Ross. Matthew is an assistant professor um, at Colorado State, and he's going to talk about big data machine learning and remote sensing to integrate lake and river research. So please join us next week. And thank you, Samantha. Stick, stay around for a minute. We'll, we'll chat for a second.